Hey, good morning. I want to thank Mike on this week's Writers on Writers over at Triple X Professor Podcast with your host, Patrick Greenwood. We are extremely deeply blessed this morning in so many ways possible that you haven't even discovered. A.M. Palmer, good morning. A.M., how are you this morning? Good morning. I'm doing very well. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Going. And I get have the chance to call you Allison, so I'm going to call you Allison as well. So, Allison, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, as everyone, you know, I want to kind of share a little beautiful light this morning. I have to tell you, this is the very first time that we have had an essayist on the podcast in two years. And so, Allison, I am deeply moved by having an essayist. And the reason I really feel very compelled to have this conversation this morning with you um, is we've had writers and we've had published publishers and we've had musicians. Uh, we've had actors, actresses come on as well. But an essayist to me is something very special. And one of the things I always wanted to ask people that write essays is really what really compels you to this writing experience. I mean, people write fiction, nonfiction, horror, suspense, military, cyber, but you're writing essays. So what really kind of drove you to say, I want to write this way. This is my style. I think I really enjoy nonfiction in general. Mm -hmm. uh, I find true stories, anything from academic research to mm -hmm. memoir and personal mm -hmm. reflections to be very, very fascinating because they speak to so many levels of human experience, things that we can all relate to, mm -hmm. uh, I would say maybe in the real world. And I also wanted to chronicle things from my career. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked as a park ranger, so I wanted to try to capture some of those memories for a fairly wide reading audience. Absolutely. Now, for those you don't know, um, you know, Allison is a retired park ranger in the San Diego area. So she had just work Bell Ball Park and yes. Mission Bay, Presidio and others. And one of the things that was interesting during our pre-call you talked about about being a park ranger is that it is partial ambassador for the city. Like you want to have a good presentation, but it's also a law enforcement position as well. So what, were there times in which you could when you were observing this, you mentioned you also do journaling as well. Did you have days in which you said, God, I wish I never saw that. I never wish I saw that scene in Bella Pulver Park versus the sunsets on Mission Bay. You know, what events really moved you the most that made you want to journal or write more? Wow, that is an excellent question. I can remember sometimes traffic accidents. Um, there was a suicide at mm -hmm. Mission Bay when I was working and I happened to be in the area. So I had to be involved with that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was interesting because the the fullness of that occupation mm -hmm. was really expressed in those moments when mm -hmm. things were difficult. Mm -hmm. And I felt very grateful to help out as best I could in certain mm -hmm. situations. It, it made me feel maybe a little bit more relevant than just kind of enjoying a, a beautiful day at the beach. <laughs> And, uh, and so, yeah, it, just having the full experience was, was the same to me. No, you mentioned uh, when you mentioned journaling on our pre-call, and I really appreciated your, your context of that as many times journaling is a great therapy. And I agree with you. I journaled as well. Um, you know, many times I, I have no problem whipping out a tablet and start writing or maybe just record it on my phone as well. How much of journaling has ended up in essays and how much is there? Do you have a stockpile of journalism somewhere and a little bit of essay or how much of it really ends up in your essays? Oh, that's a great question. My journaling practice has been mainly digital over the years. Um, I'll just open up a Word document and I have generated thousands of pages mm -hmm. for my own consideration. Mm -hmm. And I would say probably about, you know, maybe two or 3% of what I write in the journal, I really feel like I want to develop into something more substantial. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my journaling has to do with maybe just problem solving in certain situations. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very important for me when I look at my journaling material mm -hmm. to find elements that are universally relevant. Mm -hmm. So maybe a housewife in New York can get mm -hmm. an idea of what it's like to, to do what I did mm -hmm. versus a colleague who mm -hmm. could read it and say, oh, yeah, I, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that's fascinating is when you in, in your publication came out, it talked about this is a collection of, you know, poems and collections of, of essays. When you're talking about putting together a collection from like 2019 to 2023 as an example, right? Do you focus on a single genre of messaging or do you just publish whatever 
you want to publish. Because, And I asked this because I have a friend who's also a poet as well, and she's putting together a poetry book of 60 poems. And I've asked her, is it going to be a continuous poem linking one poem to the next, or is it just random poems that just whatever makes it? How do you structure your kind of storytelling? I have a lot of freedom because I self-publish. Mm -hmm. And when I thought about it, I decided, well, I'm going to do something that would not work from a marketing perspective. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get to the end. Don't worry. We'll get to the end. <laughs> this would be something that no publisher would really want to go near, but it's meaningful to me. So I usually look at things that I just wrote in the time period and things that um, I put on my blog, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And when I review the material, I might find two or three. I'm not a, really a big poet, but I found two or three poems that I really liked. Mm -hmm. um, I would find essays that I had a personal chronology of, of when I created them, although they might not, you know, sit Link in up in any way. No, no linking. It was just, just writing, right? Yeah. And I would just sit down um, and maybe I would do some graphic design and say, well, you know, this kind of looks good here if I flip the page and this fits mm -hmm. over here. So it was really just a matter of doing whatever I wanted to do creatively and having fun. I love it. Now let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned about publishing. Right. Let's start this very important point. Did you ever at some point want to query the publishing community or were you just, you know, sent on saying, you know what, I'm just going to self publish. I want it my way, my my style, my I don't want to go through the politics of trying to get it published. Or did you did you really set your tone of saying I'm going to be a self publisher? Well, when I thought about publishing with a larger established publishing agency, I really just considered my work on the history of American malls. Mm -hmm. And I have heard some positive responses from academic presses mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. So that's a possible future project. Mm -hmm. The essays I started publishing just kind of randomly in different mm -hmm. areas when I was working as a park ranger. And then when I retired, I, I got a Medium account and I just mm -hmm. started throwing things out on Medium. So <laughs> as, as the mood struck me. So mm -hmm. the order that I generated there, mm -hmm. I tried to, to replicate that a little bit for the book. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and again, the order that I achieved probably only makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess ultimately, and, and we had a chance to cover this a little bit in the pre-call as well, uh, you know, writers that come on the show, we always talk about a couple of very important things. One is that when you're writing, do you have a target audience in mind when you write? Or are you just writing of what you feel, what you want to put out there? Meant, again, from the park ranger perspective, you've had so many visions and views of your career. Uh, did you, when you're sitting down saying, okay, I'm now ready to put this in paper and putting this on Medium or putting it on LinkedIn, are you doing it with the idea that you have a certain audience or you just hope that Anybody, anybody levitates to your work. The first thing that I want to do is just put things on the record. Mm -hmm. Something, put something out there that will hopefully endure for a number of years. And, mm -hmm. and I don't, because I don't look at selling anything, I really don't have a target audience mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. mind. I would like to think that my work resonates with nomads in their 50s as I live in an RV now and I travel around the country. The, I think those are those are my people. Um, but my my belief about being a writer mm -hmm. is that, especially a nonfiction writer, you mm -hmm. really are obligated to observe mm -hmm. things carefully, to analyze thoroughly, and then present mm -hmm. your findings in a really engaging way. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, hopefully that will have a very broad level of appeal. Absolutely. Now, let's talk about a little bit differences here in nonfiction essay versus fictional essay writing. It's You brought up an interesting point about nonfiction and having to be right, and it's got to be accurate to what you're doing. Talk about potentially writing a fictional essay for a moment. Let's say that you did see something you observed while being on the job, and but you didn't want to write in that context. You wanted to have it a little bit more of a positive side of it. Have you ever thought of doing fictional essay writing, or you really just love the nonfiction, you know, so much that that's where you're going to keep your keep your stuff going? I think I'll continue to focus on nonfiction, and maybe I'll start to move into 
journalism to some extent. Mm -hmm. But that's an interesting point because when we talk about nonfiction, and I've read a number of academic articles on the subject, we really have to ask ourselves how you know true is this? Yes. How accurate is my memory? Mm -hmm. And I find myself now sometimes saying, as I recall. <laughs> well, you're older yeah. now. Come on, man. We're all up here. <laughs> we all hear ghost things, man. <laughs> And it's funny because sometimes I'm looking back on things that really did happen decades ago, and I think I remember it accurately. Um, when I when I'm dealing with things mm -hmm. pertaining to work, I mm -hmm. used to keep very detailed records for my mm -hmm. patrol reports and for my own access mm -hmm. if I ever needed to reference a case in the future. I would have things pretty well documented, mm -hmm. and sometimes I will try to jot down the details of a conversation so I really mm -hmm. remember exactly what someone said. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting when you think about that line between fiction and nonfiction, because you have a responsibility when you're calling it nonfiction, like yes. this is an essay, this is a report, mm -hmm. that yes, this really is factually correct. Yes. And, you know, again, as we get older, you have to say, I hope memory serves. You know? Yes. So it's interesting. The reason I, I, I'd like this subject matter to talk to you about this is that I write under two different genres. My real name is John Gormley, which I write on cybersecurity nonfiction. I write blogs for cybersecurity companies. So the information has to be accurate. It has to be a highest degree level of, you know, truth is, is what we know it, right? It's designed to inform and educate, right? When you take the fictional side of the world, which is my Patrick Greenwood side, it's all fiction. I could make up, you know, Mars people showing up with no toes. You know, it's all free game, right? So when you're looking at the, your world a little bit of the essay writing and you see this beautiful sunset from your RV, you know, over in New Mexico as an example, or in Arizona or Colorado, you could write it as a nonfiction, the sunrises come off with the sun, or you can say, this is the purplest, most lavender sky I've ever seen, right? Where you where you think you're going to find yourself in a year from now? Are you going to be blending fictional experience writing as you're traveling the country? Or is it more going to be, I want people to really feel the essence of the truth of what I'm seeing? I really like the idea of a hybrid genre <laughs> where I look at the poetic mm -hmm. personal reflection, mm -hmm. but then I can also introduce something about the science of sunsets or the ecology I'm dealing with because the desert is absolutely fascinating. It is. The desert and snow. So I think if you can interest people in, we'll say, the natural science of a certain area, mm -hmm. and then you're responsible for doing the research and citing the work of experts and professionals, and then tying that back to your own you know, romantic notions about the landscape. Mm -hmm. I see myself trying to develop that. It's, mm -hmm. it's difficult because when you hit the mark and mm -hmm. you can really combine the two, you yes. can create something very unique. Mm -hmm. um, and when you miss, mm -hmm. if you don't do your research well enough, mm -hmm then you fail to convey your point. So I see myself really trying to strengthen my skills in creating that, that hybrid perspective. It's beautiful. So I, let's talk a little bit about influences. So uh, I write, you know, a fiction and I have a lot of cybersecurity because I came from that space as well. But I more see myself as a, I'm a big, you know, obviously Tom Clancy fan, but I'm also a big Daniel Steele fan. I love the romance of Daniel Steele's writings. Who is your influencers? When you pick up a book and you hit, hit the Barnes and Noble, you hit on Amazon to pick up some books, who's your influencers that really kind of inspires you to say, I want to write like that person. I want to write in that style. Do you, do you have a couple of people that you kind of look to and say, you know what, that, that's kind of my people right there? I do. I was deeply, deeply fascinated by W.H. Auden and his poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And I found in his work, just a tremendous landscape of thought, of mm -hmm. conflicting emotions, mm -hmm. of an individual really observing the world in unique terms. Mm -hmm. So yeah. definitely W.H. Auden, mm -hmm. um, Edith Wharton, of course, more for her short stories than her mm -hmm. novels. Mm -hmm. And A.S. Byatt, mm -hmm. with thinking back to fiction and how much mm -hmm. I really enjoy good novels, mm -hmm. her work to me was really almost frightening. Mm -hmm. uh, it was so brilliant, and she was able to describe things really in a way that introduced you to the images in, in again, almost frightening terms. There, it was so incredibly brilliant. Mm -hmm. And in the area of journalism, I was always fascinated by Joan Didion, you know, slouching towards Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. 
And most of all, recently I have appreciated the work of W.G. Sebald, um, specifically the Rings of Saturn. And I mm -hmm. think I even taught a, a creative writing workshop mm -hmm. based on some of his work. Mm -hmm. His his com combination of novel and memoir mm -hmm. and the way he created these images with his, I guess, his Xerox machine, he would introduce these interesting graphics that nobody really understands even now. That really, that inspires me because I can think mm -hmm. now in terms of really expressing individually. Like, yeah. this is just my vision. I'll mm -hmm. put it out there mm -hmm. and let people determine what they will about it in the future. So you mentioned doing a writing workshop and had a chance to teach that. Let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the writing industry today. I have a chance to interface with a lot of people on the podcast, uh, young college kids that are still in college are trying to figure out what am I going to do with a communications degree, right? I say you can write press releases, you can write blogs, you can definitely be a social media manager and so on. What are you noticing about the writing styles of the younger generation and the older generation like us? Is it similar? Is it same? Are we completely 180 degrees in the opposite direction? What are you really seeing the younger generation writing styles compared to the older people writing styles? I haven't seen a lot of writing from the younger generation to be mm -hmm. perfectly honest. What I have seen is it's interesting and engaging mm -hmm. maybe in, in a way that appeals to digital mm -hmm. people. That is to say, if you look at something written in the 19th century that just mm -hmm. had all of these beautiful elements of sentence mm -hmm. structure, mm -hmm. sentences that really developed themselves and, and took you in different directions. Mm -hmm. Now we tend to see sentences that um, maybe are a little bit more reminiscent of Hemingway. They just boom, 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 get right to the point. And that can be a very enriching experience for readers. Mm -hmm. It's just not one for me. Right. Well, it's interesting, Alison. The reason I ask that is, uh, I've had people in our in our generation that read younger people's work, especially ones that are going through their master's programs, and they see younger people going through their MBAs, and they said most of the young people write like they're writing blogs. They don't yeah. write <laughs> academically. It's like they're writing just a short sentences of this and this and this, and I, I kind of laugh at that a little bit because it's very true. It's the time. It's a sign of the times. It's not about the quality, detailed, you know, descriptiveness or you know the level of writing. It's just writing to get by. It's writing to meet the minimal requirements of what it takes to get something done. So the idea of someone developing an art of writing tends to kind of fall short. And I have not seen a lot of younger generation writers. Now, I've read some. I've had people on the podcast that have done memoirs. They've done beautifully. And their work is incredible. But all in all, if I look at academic writing and I look at you know students' writings today, because I do mentor some college students, I kind of feed them back going, look, this is not a blog. This is not between you and your friend. This is has to have a more universal appeal. So when you're collecting kind of the journaling that you're doing and, and you eventually ends up within your essays as well, and you, you talk about social issues, you talk about things that you observe and don't think, is there a particular part of our society today that you will not write about? Is there, is there a subject matter that you look at and go, no, I, I just can't get there. Is there one of those subjects that's out there that you just say, you know what, it's not worth my pen? There are definitely a number of troubling things that we see now in social media, um, aspects of culture that are really not worth putting on video, sure. things that people should really keep to themselves. Um, maybe it's a hyper-confessional thing that we see in the digital world that, mm -hmm. you know. So I think I, I tend not to veer towards sensationalistic things, the things that people just do to get on a video that are really... Yes. I think harmful. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there are very sensitive issues that I think are important to discuss. Mm -hmm. And I would like to approach some of them in the future, but they do require very careful research and study mm -hmm. so that number one, I understand what I'm evaluating as fully mm -hmm. as possible. And number two, I can make a useful contribution to uh, our overall knowledge base about a subject. Well, I'm glad, you know, that I thank you for saying that, Allison, because that really is writing responsibility. And many times as I'm writing and reading and other people's stuff or I read stuff online or whatever, I just shake my head going, where did they get this from? You know, this is not this is not even opinion. I mean, this is really a distortion. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about writing 2024, 2025. AI has a big part of our industry. Um, you know, many people are concerned that AI is going to take over the writing world. 
I'm more the opposite saying it's a great tool. I use it for research. It helps me determine my search engine optimization when I write blogs. It has value, but I don't see myself being replaced by an AI unless somebody really just feels compelled to say, click, prompt, done, and publish. And I always ask them, do you plan to put your name on that? <laughs> if you do, you're done because you didn't write it. How do you see AI coming into the essay writing world? Or do you still see the people are looking at the individual, getting to know you, Allison, getting to know you and say, I want to read Allison's work. So how do you see AI affecting the uh, essayist side of our writing community? I really only <laughs> see it as a tool, as you were mentioning, a search engine optimization tool. <laughs> That's really wonderful. <laughs> But some of the AI generated things I've seen have been, there's really no point because whatever your writing style is, whatever your message is, it needs to come from you. So people know who's saying it and then people know who to Hello. <laughs> that's, that's the whole reason we're there. Um, and I have seen, I think in LinkedIn is using some AI generated tags for posts that lead people into mm -hmm. different areas. And I, I emailed them. I said, this has nothing to do with my post. Yes. You know, AI is not getting it. It's not contributing to the reading experience. It's actually detracting from it. Agreed. So yeah. I, I think probably most people will just use it as a search tool. Hopefully it, it, I don't think it will ever replace us. No, I don't. And I have, I, as a writer, um, you know, on, on my blog writing side, I've had clients, you know, replace me with AI. Um, and they said, you know, we're just going to go chat GDP and we're going to save some money. I'm like, all right. About a month later, um, would you <laughs> mind coming back and doing what you just did? Like, And I just kind of smirk saying, because they ultimately realize that AI is so immature. It has political biasness. It sometimes takes the wrong tone. It takes the wrong dictation. Uh, it, it presents a value statement that does not align with organization. So when you realize that you're putting all that in jeopardy, that you're about to throw something out there. I love when I hear stories of lawyers or sports writers or, or entertainment writers get busted for publishing stuff without even, you know, even making an effort and then just putting it into the prompt engine. And uh, so I, I do agree with you. I do think that it's, uh, it's going to be there. It's going to be somewhere in our, in our industry, but I don't see writers, especially writers that have a unique voice like yourself, have, a, have the ability to be replaced because you can't be replaced by something artificial. They really want to hear from you. They want to hear from your soul as well. So let's tap on the soul for a moment because, you know, we always get into the ugly word of M on this podcast. Let's talk a little bit about marketing. Now, I have to tell you, when I asked this question in the pre-call, you know, I always do it to get people's facial reactions, but you were straight <laughs> up and said, I make no money doing this. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so, so what is your marketing plan? So my, my overall marketing plan is, again, it's really not a plan. As I travel, I meet people who sometimes express an interest in the things that interest me. And I sometimes I hear from people, I, I went to a credit union to open a new account. And the guy said, oh, you're a writer. Well, I love to read. And I said, well, you know, go ahead and Google this and then you'll mm -hmm. find my website. Mm -hmm. So I typically find new readers one by one. Mm -hmm. And we usually have a really good conversation about what interests us, and what writing styles they value. So to grow the blog one person at a time, very slowly, that's what I'm doing. And I've also done some freelance writing in the past. And that mm -hmm. usually consists of sending a few emails that never get answered. <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, marketing is... For me, I just decided I was really never going to make any money anyway, and I wasn't going to worry about it. Um, I was just going to go ahead and write and try to leave some sort of a contribution to the world of arts and letters and, yeah. and leave it at that. I love it. So, and this is, again, I, I, the reason I love this, Allison, so much is because when I talk to writers and many of them write their first book, so they write their first blog, and they're like, didn't make any money. Are you doing it for the love of what you do? Or are you doing it to, you know, retire in the Bahamas? And it's interesting how if they don't have that headspace originally when they go into it, what are you doing it for? Is it to connect with people? Is it just to have an outreach for your emotions? Is it how you feel you're going to grow as a person? If you really think you're going to make money, good luck. It's not a money generating <laughs> ordeal. However, meeting friends, like I've met a lot of writers on my book tours. I've met a lot of writers on the podcast that are wonderful friends. We communicate quite often uh, as well. And that's why I do it. 
you know, and ultimately, I think for you, the way you, you express yourself and how you do it is wonderful as well. But but ultimately, I think what's interesting is, do you think you're ever going to get to a point in life to say, I'm ready to maybe do a full novel? I, I, I may want to become a novelist or or what? What, what is going to happen to you in a year from now when you say, I've done the essay and toured the country, I've been in my thing. Do you, do you really see yourself sitting down, pounding it out in a coffee shop going, I want to create a novel? Or or what is going to be the next project for you? I have two projects in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one will be a, a second collection of essays. Mm -hmm. I'm putting that together slowly. That'll involve some graphic design work. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything but the kitchen sink that I think will be interesting. Love it. And... Then the second thing I want to do is really look at some of the uh, more troubling aspects of our culture, and I won't be really specific at this point, mm -hmm. but I'm interested in the work of investigative journalism, mm -hmm. uh, seeing if I can, again, investigate certain things that are going on in the world now, mm -hmm. and maybe even create a historiography, something that will guide readers to understand the topic more mm -hmm. fully and to see what's been put out there already. Mm -hmm. and maybe interpret it more effectively. But mm -hmm. yeah, investigative journalism might be something for the future, but mm -hmm. definitely there will be yet another collection of essays. I, I enjoy creating those with, with, again, some random bits of photography and graphic design. Beautiful. So how can best people get hold of you? I had a chance, you and I have LinkedIn, so we have had a chance to chat during LinkedIn as well. What's the best way that people can follow you? How can they look for your work and you know where can they pick up your essays as well? So my blog, unfortunately, has a very cumbersome uh, address. It's best to just go to Google and mm -hmm. put in A.M. Palmer Literary mm -hmm. and search that. And my website should be the first thing that comes up. You'll see a little okay. picture of a typewriter. It's a ghost account. So, yeah, okay. people want to go there, check it out and uh, and enjoy the work. That would be wonderful. Oh, it's beautiful. Well, Allison, thank you so much for coming on this week's Writers and Writers over Triple Coaster Podcast. I love following your work. I look forward to your next work. And as you're traveling around the country and your thing, you know, reach out. Love to have you come back on the podcast, especially if we get closer to have some more essays get published as well. Thank you so much. No, everyone, thanks for making on this week's Writers and Writers over Triple Coaster Podcast. Your host, Patrick Greenwood. We'll see you on next week. Take care.